We had a break scheduled, but we're going to pick up a little bit of time here and just roll right into our privacy panel. So if we have our panelists in the audience, I see Mr. Diaz here and others. If you could come up to the uh, panel, I'm going to be stationed here, Mr. Berman on the end. And I believe we're going to have Robin, Courtney, and then John right there. Thank you. Okay, we have a topic for you that is almost as hot as Clay Thompson's three-point shooting last night. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, go watch the replay. It's uh, something you don't see that often. So our panel is tech, privacy, and democracy, and all the implications therein. Over the past few years, we have been constantly reminded about the unintended consequences of technology. Cyber attacks, data breaches, and the misuse of social media, including Russia's intervention in the 2016 presidential election. Well, we've, all know, we've also witnessed the power of technology to shape and influence public opinion and policy. Concurrently, there has been more scrutiny on information shared and how it is used and what happens when personal data is breached. And there have been some pretty high profile examples of data breaches, Target, Equifax, Cambridge Analytica, and Facebook itself. Our panel will explore how technology can be harnessed for good and what government's role is in regulating or encouraging beneficial use. So Facebook provides the ideal backdrop for us to explore these topics. We have assembled a panel from academia, industry and media to address this topic from their sector and experience. We are very pleased to be joined from left to right, Robin Feldman, distinguished professor at UC Hastings College of Law, who is a noted expert on technology and law. Courtney Bowman, co-director of Palantir's Privacy and Civil Liberties Engineering Team, who grapples with these issues on a daily basis. And John Diaz, the editorial page editor with the San Francisco Chronicle, who has written extensively about technology, policy, and the implications for our democracy, uh, including uh, extensive coverage of Jackie Spears' consumer financial privacy uh, legislation, SB1, uh, from the late 90s, which was a high-profile privacy uh, example. And he's returned early from his Hawaiian vacation to join us uh, on the panel uh, today. So, um, we are going to start with Rob, and I'm also curious, uh, as the conversation unfolds, to get their reactions. I guess Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, made a big announcement of support of a national data privacy law, in addition to California's own uh, AB 375, the California Consumer Protection Act, uh, and he was quoted as saying, data is being weaponized. So, uh, we have a very timely topic in front of us today, but let's go ahead and start with court, uh, pardon me, start with with Robin, uh, then Courtney, and we'll conclude with John, and then we'll open it up for sort of a, a free flow uh, conversation. With that, let me turn it over to Robin. Thank you. Better? Great, thank you. Interesting to hear about weaponization of data. Uh, I had the pleasure of participating last year in the Army, Army Cyber Institute's threat casting exercise on weaponization of data. Wonderful and, and fascinating to see people sitting around a room and thinking about all of the things one might do to weaponize data and all of the ways one can recover. But I'm speaking this morning about artificial intelligence and the importance of both trust and distrust. You know, artificial intelligence is already permeating throughout society. In the automobile industry, AI systems help drivers steer, change lanes, and park. Banks use AI to advise customers and also to assess your credit risk and to decide whether you're committing fraud. Employers use AI to decide whether to hire you. And in the healthcare, brain interfaces use thought to control complex uh, robotic limbs. Now, advancement in AI has happened at an absolutely breathtaking pace, one that would take lifetimes in other industries. So consider the highest profile modern AI network, Google's AlphaGo. 
The difference between just the two latest versions of AlphaGo is analogous to the difference between the IBM Simon, the first touchscreen phone, rudimentary phone 25 years ago, and this year's new iPad Pro. Um, but in, in AI, that kind of advancement happened in under two years. It's really astounding to contemplate the changes that are happening for that. Um, now, for money people, the notion of AI brings to mind an eerie computer voice announcing the takeover of the world and the end of the human race. Um, however, the potential for truly sentient AI, uh, one that can make decisions and operate on its own, remains in the mind of science fiction writers at this point. For now, and really for the foreseeable future, human augmentation systems are likely to be the things that we see. So for those of you who are movie buffs, um, think Iron Man in which the hero in a weaponized suit is able to enhance his capacities as opposed to Terminator in which the machine-like cyborg uh, uh, takes over everything on its own. We'll see human-machine interaction systems in which each can enhance the other as opposed to uh, one taking over. Um, and as one uh, expert commented to me recently, even that is a little optimistic. Uh, we can't have anything like Iron Man because today machines are just plain dumb. We have to teach them what a stop sign is and we are light years away from machines being able to think on their own. So that, that lies in, in the future, but what's interesting is what we can do today. Because as we speed into this great new future, we have to recognize the importance, as I mentioned at the beginning, of both trust and distrust. On the simplest level, um, people will have to be coaxed into using these newfangled devices because people tend to fear what is unfamiliar. So I don't know if you know, but 52,000 people uh, die in this country each year from influenza, and yet, People fear a bomb exploding on an airplane much more than they fear getting the flu. It's a, it's a thing that is unfamiliar that we worry about the most. So with AI, it's, it's not just a matter of encouraging those of us over 40 or those of us well over 40 uh, to use the newfangled devices. It's also that the complete power of AI can't be optimized unless you have everybody on board. So think about uh, truly driverless cars. When we get to that point, everyone will be networked who is using a driverless car. So your car won't just slow down when the car in front of you slows down. It's going to be networked and it will react when the vehicle 10 cars ahead changes speed or changes direction. So cars will be able to be closer together. Um, traffic flows will be more efficient. People will spend less time on the road, will use less fuel. There are really good things that can be happened when we're all in these network systems. Now, imagine that you throw a human driver in there every once in a while and think what it does to the system because uh, we human drivers are stunningly irrational and difficult to understand and um, predict. So this is why we have to think about how we're gonna bring people into the system and have them trusted enough to actually use it so that we optimize it. Now trust has other facets as well. If we want both ordinary citizens and government to have faith in the credibility of AI, there have to be methods of validating and analyzing the choices that the AI systems are make. Is it trust but verify, an old notion? The entire issue of verification is complicated by the black box nature of a lot of AI systems. It's tough to understand what they're doing and how they're doing. But when decisions being made that can result in someone going to jail or choosing between killing the driver of an autonomous vehicle and killing six pedestrians, we have to find ways to interrogate the technology that made that decision so that we can understand it. How do we have those pathways um, for seeing what has happened? And then how do we translate that verification, that interrogation into language that will expire confidence in ordinary citizens around the country? So both of these tasks require a level of openness and candor that are not necessarily familiar to either industry or to government players. 
a company's first instinct is not going to be to open the doors to its technology, particularly if competitors are peering in through those doors. However, people are unlikely to trust a system just because we sit back and say soothingly, trust us, we've got this under control. We have to find ways to look at it, understand it, and get people to trust it. Um, AI systems also will need human interface for a long time, um, at, at least as far as any of the scientists that I talk to can predict. Um, they simply won't be able to operate without the type of verification and human backup that is needed. If you think about the introductory remarks that were made here, AI systems are no more impenetrable than any other technology. And when hackers corrupt the data, the system will still think it's operating properly when it is not. You need human beings who can recognize and recover when systems happen for something like that. Um, so as we step into this new system, we have to find and develop the legal pathways that will allow us to both use, to appreciate, but also to respect and understand its limitations. As much as we have to learn to trust technology, we also need a healthy distrust of that technology. We need to understand its limits. We need not to just put our hands in it. Tesla drivers, for example, have been known to climb into the back seat of their car or drive with a newspaper in front of their face, which gives the technology um, far more rain than its capacity warrants. These are the types of challenges we have, and for our um, public service and public policy experts, the challenges are figuring out legal systems that will foster both the levels of trust and distrust that we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. John, John wouldn't mind you reading the newspaper as long as it's a hard copy of the Chronicle uh, in your autonomous vehicle. And one note about the autonomous vehicle, I actually took a test ride of an autonomous vehicle and asked the engineer what the biggest challenge was. And he said, reading body language. So an individual may not be stepping off the curb yet when they're about to cross the street, but we can tell when that individual is getting ready to step out. And that's challenging for machines. Just a quick sidebar there. But let me turn it over to Courtney Bowman with Palantir to talk about what uh, keeps him up at 3 in the morning. Thanks. Um, and thank you, Robin. That was a, a fantastic setup. And I, I hope in my remarks to go um, maybe a little bit deeper and to provide um, a, a, an industry perspective. Um, it's, it's my job at Palantir Technologies, which is a software company that's uh, down the road and in, in, uh, headquartered in Palo Alto. Um, to focus on the practical implications of technology and to help our engineers and our customers navigate um, some of the issues around the use of advanced technologies, particularly around um, a sensitive information uh, and uh, processing of that, that sensitive information. Um, so I think as we, as we look at uh, the state of, of new technologies, new information technologies like, uh, like artificial intelligence um, and the subclass of applications called machine learning, um, it's worth uh, in this moment of, of sort of uh, exuberance and feverish uh, um, froth in the industry to take a step back and look at the historical perspective. Um, and if we, if we look back uh, almost 60 years now, um, uh, we see some of the themes that, that Robin pointed out play, played out a long time ago. Um, a, originally in the, sort of the early days of artificial intelligence uh, development, figures, luminary figures like Marvin Minsky were predicting in the late 50s, early 60s that generalized artif artificial intelligence was just around the corner and we were, we were just on the cusp of this sort of uh, emergence of new robots, new, new machines that were going to supplant the role of humans in all manner uh, of society. Um, and, and clearly we're not, we're not there, right? Um, the technologies that we have in our hand are more along the lines of the augmented um, capabilities uh, that, we, that we hold in our hands every day, the, the mobile phones uh, that we use um, to, to help facilitate certain actions in the world. Um, and so what, what happened? What, what, was the, the, what was the breakdown? What, what was it that, uh, that led us down this alternative path? 
And I, I would submit uh, for your consideration that there's something of a category distinction um, that plays out in the way that we, we think about artificial intelligence and the capacities it's actually capable of delivering upon. Um, oh, one, one, I think, critical insight here uh, about what machines do and what they don't do is that machines provide us with a sort of formalized mechanism for carrying out tasks that we program them to do. Uh, in the words of, of uh, the Berkeley philosopher John Searle, the machines give us, they give us syntax without the semantics. They provide a sort of form, a mathematical formalism for carrying out tasks, but they don't actually intuit and carry out the cognitive states, uh, the mental capacities, the intuitions, uh, the intentional um, uh, uh, acts of the mind that constitute human judgment. And it's, it's important to realize this even though uh, we're talking about um, what's, what's termed in the industry, sort of specialized artificial intelligence um, or weak artificial intelligence as opposed to strong artificial intelligence. Even in these weaker applications where we're dealing with very specialized methods of intervening in the world, um, we still, in looking at the failures, the categorical distinctions, um, it brings us uh, to a point of, of understanding what it is that this technology can and cannot do. Uh, and in, in acknowledging what those limitations are, we come a little bit closer to realizing what the value of, of uh, new technologies like artificial intelligence are. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that I, that I focus on that um, uh, my company is, is, is very directed at dealing with, is understanding what the limitations are of, of certain technologies. So uh, when you're thinking about applications of, of these technologies in practice, um, you may start with some, some threshold questions, like what sorts of issues actually are intended to be disrupted, or what things should be, dis where is there a, a real opportunity or a need for disruption? Um, and you can look at the examples abound of instances where it just doesn't make sense to apply new technologies for certain applications. Um, uh, one example is research at Stanford a number of years ago looking at um, facial recognition to determine um, sexual orientation. It's sort of one of these problems where you take a step back and you have to acknowledge that there are certain questions that should not avail themselves to certain types of problems. And you treat that as a threshold and then move on to, to later um, types of interventions uh, and, and considerations in building these technologies. Uh, and then you move on to, to further issues of understanding some of the, um, the issues that are implicit in building technologies, issues around sample bias and fairness uh, and accountability and explainability. These sorts of, these sorts of considerations become the critical determinants in building out sensible approaches to the, the applications of these, of these technologies um, because the, 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 the critical point to, to call out here, again, going back to, to um, one of the considerations that I was bringing up earlier is that computers don't understand. They don't, they don't think in the ways that we do and they're not capable of doing that and, and arguably may never be capable of doing that. Um, what it is that is unique to human intelligence is our capacity to carry out normative reasoning. And when you acknowledge that these normative functions, the ability to do ethical reasoning over complex problem sets is critical to the interventions and the promises of these technologies, you realize that there is an enduring place for humanity to help, uh, to help sort of shepherd uh, the application of these technologies. Um, and, uh, So this, this sort of recognition of, of there being sort of good ways and bad ways of, of using technologies, good ways and bad ways of applying um, advanced technologies um, can help provide us with some, guard, with some guide rails on what we should and should not do with respect to, uh, to novel uh, interventions and novel applications of, of machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, and other emerging information technologies. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Courtney.
A lot to digest there and a lot to think about, and we'll circle back with Courtney on some of those questions that, that he posed for consideration. So I want to bring John Diaz in, editorial page editor of The Chronicle, who uh, has written quite a bit about the collision, really, of tech and privacy concerns and implications on our democracy going forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to John. Well, thank you very much, uh, Assemblymember Mullen, and uh, good morning to you all. If I could just, uh, uh, for a second, correct one thing that the Assembly member said when he said that we need you to read the print edition. We also sell digital subscriptions. <laughs> if you got your smartphone, sfchronicle.com. <laughs> Uh, I'm, anyway, I'm not giving up my hard copy. I'm old school oh, that no, way. No, we, we definitely prefer that you do both. But just, just set the record straight here, especially here at Facebook. I have a feeling the print copy. I, I didn't see a whole lot as I was going through uh, there. Uh, anyway, uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Obviously, the whole issue of tech privacy and democracy is something that I've thought a lot about and have written a lot about in the last few years. And I guess the bottom line that I have is I think when it comes to uh, privacy, there's a paradox out there in the public. Uh, American consumer, consumers say they are concerned about their use of the use of their personal information. Polls show there's no doubt about that. But they're not necessarily willing to take action to do something about it. Just think about it. How many of us really read those privacy notices before we check the box? Or um, how many are hesitating, let alone stopping at downloading an app that may be taking in a lot of and reusing your personal information? I mean, who knew or who really cared when the Federal Trade Commission in 2013 sanctioned, of all things, a flashlight app, a flashlight app for offering advertising networks the location of cell phones even before the user clicked accept. So on, on one hand, you talk to people, uh, they're, they're concerned about the abuse of their uh, personal information. They want the le legislature or Congress to do something about it, but they're not necessarily willing to do something about it themselves. Now, now there are two California laws that have been passed that I say put this paradox in high relief. Uh, Kevin mentioned uh, financial privacy. Well, for me, my introduction to that, uh, um, that issue started in, in 2000 when I wrote about a financial privacy bill in the state legislature uh, that would basically force banks, insurance, commission, uh, insurance companies, and other financial institutions to get your permission before they sold or shared your personal information with a third party. Did some research on it, seemed eminently sensible, wrote an editorial, uh, re and, and in very unusually, and especially remember, this is the year 2000 before social media became anything close to what it is today, received hundreds of emails, which was really unusual. I thought, hmm, and then the bill was summarily killed in committee. So the following year, I thought I'm gonna get, um, get on this issue earlier and write about it so that I don't write about it right before it's near the end of session. So I wrote, uh, came back the following year, as uh, Assemblymember Mullen noted, uh, Jackie Spear, member of Congress now, was a state senator representing uh, this area, was the prime sponsor, came back with a, with a bill. And, and I remember the first editorial I wrote introducing uh, that issue for that session was I'd interviewed the chairman of the uh, banking, Assembly Banking Committee, who had really been, uh, one of the prime people who killed the bill the previous year and talked to him about it. He said, you know, people, you know, maybe the press cares about this, maybe some consumer groups do, maybe some, you know, zealous privacy advocates, but people don't really care. So my headline was, he thinks you don't care. Well, it turns out, as this was going on, it really, it really picked up in terms of, this is 2001, really, picked up in terms of public engagement. You know, they were, they were just peppering, you know, and one of the things that I, I found too is that the editorials had a lot more power when I would put the email addresses of the key players. And, uh, and there was one point where the, uh, the chairman of the banking committee, uh, Lou Papp, and uh, 
uh, Ashley, uh, the late Lou Pappen, who was, uh, of course, from the peninsula, he complained to some of the consumer groups. He goes, uh, I got 3,000 emails about this issue. He goes, you have some kind of phony AstroTurf campaign going uh, uh, against me. And one of the consumer advocates says, no, actually it's because your email was in the Chronicle. <laughs> but, but for all this, the banks at this point and the financial industry was really ramped up. They really, uh, they had some, not only substantive uh, concerns about how the bill would affect them, because actually, especially after some deregulation in Congress in the late 1990s, it had really become part of the business model of the financial uh, and service industry to share and sell information, particularly among their affiliates. So they really ramped up. Uh, Gray Davis, who was the governor of California at the time, uh, was certainly listening to the financial industry and very much waffling on this bill, making it clear that he wasn't prepared to sign it, and it got killed again. So that brings us to 2002. We did not give up at the Chronicle. <laughs> We're still writing about this. And Jackie Spears, certainly, those who know her, is not one to give up easily. And uh, it became really one of the higher profile issues in the legislature, and, and yet the bill was killed again, a third time in a row. And, and it certainly showed the power of the financial industry lobbyists. Um, they had spent some, upward of $20 million in lobbying to stop this legislation. Now consider there are only 120 mem members of the legislature and they're spending $20 million. That's obviously uh, formidable. And, and along those lines, you know, we had charts of how people were voting. If you looked at any given time, a majority of members of both the Senate and Assembly had voted for that bill, but it never was passed because they would take a walk, which is my term, or stay off a bill or lay off a bill, you know the terms, members of the Assembly. And, uh, and so, so it kept getting, kept getting defeated and, and lost again in, in 2002. 2003, <laughs> we're at it again. Um, two things changed. At this point, polls showed that somewhere around 90% of Californians wanted some kind of control over their personal financial information, and yet it wasn't getting done in the legislature. Two things changed. One, uh, Chris Larson, who's the CEO of eLoan at the time, obviously he's had some other um, uh, ventures since then, he, he, he thought that, uh, that really the important, that it was very important to the financial sector that he was working on, that people had confidence that, that their personal information was not being uh, misused. So he bankrolled, he spent somewhere around a million dollars to get the signatures to put it on the ballot. So suddenly, the financial industry, which was looking at uh, the prospect of a ballot measure, which he actually qualified, uh, which would be far stricter than anything that would happen in the legislature, because the legislature will listen to the reasonable concerns of the financial industry, the workability issues. The voters were just gonna say the hell with it. We want you to get our permission. So that qualified for the ballot and, and also, um, uh, Gray Davis, who, as you recall, in 2003 was facing a recall, suddenly came off the fence. <laughs> so, so it ended up this bill passed by overwhelming majorities. There were uh, single-digit oppositions in both the Senate and Assembly. In fact, I was there on the day of final passage, and it was remarkable because I remember there was one legislator in particular who was up there railing and I, I was standing next to Jackie Spear at the time, and he was saying, the outrage is that it took us so long to get this bill. And, and I looked at Jackie Spear, and I said, am I wrong? Didn't he not vote against this at every turn? And she goes, yep. <laughs> so so that, certainly, uh, that certainly made a difference. Uh, Governor uh, Davis, who at the time was facing a, um, a recall, ended up signing the bill into law. Um, this, this actually became somewhat of a template, or we're seeing history repeat itself this year with the, uh, 
recently passed California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. It's going to take effect in January 2020. And I, I will say a lot of businesses, uh, not just tech, even, even my business, which uh, you know, certainly on our digital platforms, uh, will, will be using uh, personal information uh, with advertising, are very concerned uh, about it. But still, there was no stopping it. Uh, consider that Cambridge uh, Analytica scandal, which broke in March 2018, and Americans who were on Facebook, and that includes almost everybody, and I'm not just saying that because I'm here, um, the, um, uh, were very concerned about targeting uh, advertising. And by May, more than, uh, a sponsor had collected more than 600,000 signatures for a sweeping ballot measure. Um, as a result, the legislature came back, came through, signed, and, and passed the Privacy Act, and it was signed into law by Governor Brown on June 28th. There's four basic rights for consumers in there. One, the right to know uh, what information is being collected, where it's sourced, what's, what it's being used for, and whether it's shared or sold, and to whom. The right to opt out of a business uh, selling to third parties. Uh, the right to compel a business to delete personal information with some exceptions, and no discrimination in price or service if you exercise those rights. So I think what we have here is, like it or not, uh, government is involved. These legislatures in Sacramento and Washington are involved in the regulation of privacy. Um, I say for better and for, for worse, those of you who recall the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings uh, where Mark Zuckerberg was, was testifying, and you saw the uh, degree of knowledge that some of these senators had about how things work when they talked about things like sending emails on, on WhatsApp or, or, or Senator Orrin Hatch sort of famously asking Zuckerberg, now, how does it work? How do you have a, a business model where you're giving something away for free? And Zuckerberg said, we sell ads, sir. <laughs> so, so I think uh, this is where we're at. I think there is going to be continued pressure uh, on the legislature and on Congress to act. Thank you, John. And uh, let's give John a hand. John uh, walked us through that SB1 saga, and I was on Jackie Spears' staff at the time, and she will, if she were here today, she would uh, attribute that ultimate success to the attention drawn to that issue by the Chronicle and then the resulting public uh, opinion pressure, and the legislature absolutely is responsive uh, to public pressure, uh, in addition to uh, giving lobbyists an audience as well as part of the, as part of the job. Uh, we are going to... Uh, open it up for questions from the audience. We have some microphones that are going to be floating around. In the meantime, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Assemblymember Berman, if you have a question uh, for the panel. You know, John talked about regulation, how we get that balance right. That was a pretty high profile example uh, on Capitol Hill of sort of the divide between policymakers and some of the tech experts. But let me toss it over to you uh, in case you have a question that can kind of get our round robin discussion moving. Well, thank you, Assemblymember Mullen, and thanks everyone uh, for the great uh, kind of presentations. And a question that I wanted to ask was I often say that technology is going to be ready a lot sooner than society is. Uh, and, and it's really the role of policymakers to develop, as, as Professor Feldman mentioned, you know, the regulatory framework for a lot of this new technology. I tried to do this in my first year uh, in the assembly last year with a bill uh, to create a pilot program for autonomous freight, autonomous trucking. Uh, which, which hadn't gotten a lot of attention. Uh, and I kind of ran into this buzzsaw where industry hated the bill because it went too slow and not far enough. And I'll say the, the incumbents, uh, the, the, the local uh, kind of um, uh, companies and uh, in particular the, the labor unions that represent the truckers hated the bill because they thought it went too far too fast. Uh, and what ended up happening is nothing. Uh, the bill died. I, I snuck it out of one committee. It died in the second committee. Um, but 
we, as we saw with the privacy bill this year, sometimes the legislature is forced to react to react to outside pressures as opposed to being proactive uh, and, and putting together the regulatory framework with input from everybody so that we actually have a well thought out nuanced policy framework, which doesn't happen when you get initiatives like we had you know, with, with the privacy bill was really spurred by an initiative that was a threat uh, and the legislature reacted to that outside threat, but not really in a way that, that discussed the nuances. So my question is what, does it, what will it take to get industry to come together um, to to offer up a policy framework as as opposed to their just kind of reflexive reaction of no regulation, no regulation, no regulation, um, which then gets to a point where there's overly regulation that's that's actually bad for the industry. And I think academia can play a role in in convening folks in a in a low pressure uh, kind of data driven situation. I, I can take an initial stab at this. So, so I think you, you diagnose the pathology here, and this is, this is the history of, of privacy and technology um, going back over 150 years to the advent of the Kodak camera, which motivated Warren and Brandeis to write their seminal um, uh, right to privacy paper, um, which designated privacy as a sort of this notional right to be left alone. Um, and, and if you look at the history of Fourth Amendment jurisprudence in the U.S., is a similar sort of issue of technology kind of pushing the normative boundaries of what, what we expect uh, as, as a society. And I think on some level we have to accept that that's always going to be the case, uh, in part because none of us can look into the future and, and prognosticate what's going to happen down the road and how technology um, will, will continue to, to challenge the normative assumptions in our life. But, but that said, I think there, there are ways of building frameworks to, uh, and, and these are frameworks that industry and, and academics and practitioners uh, and policymakers can all sort of get, get behind um, to, to build law and build regulations that anticipate how these, uh, these technologies are going to continue to push these boundaries. And we have, we have a lot of these frameworks already. Um, one example is the fair information practice principles, which is sort of a staple of, of privacy legislation the world over, not just in the US. Um, it articulates um, principles around minimization and use limitation and right to redress uh, and, and other accountability principles. Uh, and I think that's, that's sort of the, the, the key uh, approach to, to building regulation that has enduring value is rather than focusing on the, the particular state of the technology now, so that we end up with something like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which was written in the, the mid 80s and barely anticipates the advent of, of email, and so you get these, these challenging issues around third party doctrine. Um, instead of that, you have principles that have enduring value and that will transcend the particular state of the technology now and will give us some, some guidelines and, and thoughts on how um, we can deal with emerging, emerging technology and sort of get around the, those challenges that are, that are created by um, this constant pushing of the boundaries. Thank you. So thinking ahead of the game is, rather than just reacting when things happen, is hugely important. And it's not just because we don't think as well in a crisis, it's also because if we wait, the options may, get, may be circumscribed by the direction in which the technology and in which society has gone, and then we have fewer choices at that point. Um, the development of regulation and, and uh, legal systems can also frame the expectations that develop in society. So if a 16-year-old hits my car, um, I expect that 16-year-old to pay for the damage. I don't expect remuneration from the government that had the bad decision making to, to give this kid a license. I don't expect remuneration from the kid's parents whose loose driving uh, parenting styles probably contributed to his lousy driving. These are expectations that have been developed through the law. So we, we need the legal and regulatory systems to help us develop those expectations as a society. And we can't just wait till things happen. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's a real uh, quandary because on, on one hand, you do not want to stifle the technology. Courtney, you made a good point about the electronic privacy laws being in the mid-80s. I mean, for most of my career, we've written about the Communications Act of 1934, which, uh, which had a lot of uh, endurance. You know, the, the problem is, is that the technology is moving so fast, and, and most of the people who really have a grasp 
like yourself on, on how it's moving are not serving as congressional staffers, or let alone elected members. Uh, so I, I agree with Courtney. I think it has to be based on principles. But even, even those basic <laughs> principles, there are people who are going to be smart enough or devious enough, pick your point, uh, pick your term to get around it. So uh, I want to ask a quick question about mistrust. Uh, we've got industry, media, government here on the panel. Mistrust of tech, mistrust of media, mistrust of knowledge and facts, mistrust of government seem to permeate our society right now. Our democratic, small d, democratic institutions are being undermined uh, in the national narrative on a regular basis. Um, and there's a real problem around rebuilding trust in the major institutions, those sort of pillars of our society. And you have a number of institutions represented on this panel. How do we turn this around? The trend line is problematic. And it goes to sort of the heart of uh, what it means to live in a democracy. How do we tackle this issue from your individual sectors? And then we'll open it up to the audience, whoever wants to grab that one where there really is no answer. Um, so we'll but solve a, this a, and then after a that question we'll, out there. Yeah, we'll solve this and then after that we'll move to world peace. Um, <laughs> It's very hard, and, and that's one of the things of, about the importance of establishing trust. It's easier to establish up front than to fix it when it's broken, and we are in a uh, particular system in which it's, it's broken. The, the general things I would say is that trust gets built in small ways and in personal connections, and that's where you have to begin. You have to um, allow people to see things in small ways that they trust, to interact with other human beings, not just the technology. You don't build trust by sending someone an information sheet in the front of their, their technology. You really need the human factor for trust much more than a robotic one. And I would just say we, we have a long way to go. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, trust is, is built through dialogue and, and presence. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's been uh, one failing of, of certain aspects of, of, of industry. Um, and there's critical need to, to, to build new opportunities like this um, for, for industry uh, representatives, technologists, scientists, um, to sit down with community members and to focus on, I think, a point that Robin did a fantastic job of, of, of drawing out in, in her comments earlier, that there's, there's a lot of myth and misconception around the prospects of, of technology. Um, and a lot of work needs to be done to sort of ground the discussion in common terms uh, to help translate the, these concepts into, um, into ideas that are explainable to, to a lay audience um, so that uh, we can get beyond the, the, the science fiction rendition of technology that tends towards uh, fear-mongering and dystopic, dystopic views of, of the world and instead focuses on the issues at hand. And once we, we sort of de-escalate um, the, the level of, of discourse um, and sit down together and talk through the issues um, in, a sober, uh, in a sober way, then I think we, we can move forward some of these, these issues of trust. It, at the risk of pandering to Assemblymember Mullen, who just uh, successfully authored the Disclose Act on, on political campaign, I, I think the key for all these institutions, in, including the media, is transparency. I, I think the, the, this mistrust, this distrust uh, that is fanned at the highest levels of this country um, it is, is spawned in part because people don't really understand how we work and what we aim to do. It's true in media, it's true in government. I don't know, there, there's a, a new book out by Michael Lewis uh, on, on basically the Trump administration, how they came in and were undermining government. And, and I think if, if you read that book, I think it, you know, as Americans read that and see how these agencies work and what they do and how they affect our lives in ways that people might not even think. They just think of the bureaucracy. And I think that's true for all institutions, whether it's the legislature, whether it's um, the judiciary, uh, whether it's the, certainly whether it's the media, is to be much more forthcoming in explaining what we do. Because if you look at it right now, uh, there, are, there are so many more sources, resources for Americans to find out uh, what's going on. They no longer have to just read our account of a, 
of a court ruling, they can go in and read for themselves uh, all 104 pages or <laughs> whatever it is. And and I think um, I think we in media we have to be in, in a sense field guides for uh, Americans. We may be a bit over time, but I want to make sure we get to a couple of audience questions. Anybody have a question for our panel? They solved world peace while we were talking That's up right. here. So yeah, <laughs> I guess we, I guess we did. Yes. If you could stand up, with, thank you. Hi. I don't know if this question is better for the professor or the whole panel, but I'm curious as to whether you think that the U.S. will ever catch up with the European Union and looking at personal data privacy rights, which I know a lot of the tech companies are scrambling to do right now because there's protections for people in Europe, but there are not protections for people in the U.S. So do you think the law in America will ever catch up with, with where the EU is now and what they're doing, which is proactive, versus what we're doing here, which is really nothing? So I, I think the, the California, it's recently passed Privacy Act comes a long way uh, towards catching up with where Europe is. It's very similar in, in many ways. That's one, you know, that's one state. Across the country, um, I think there will always be significant differences between Europe and, and between this country. And in part, um, and, and I say this in the positive way of trust, we actually trust technology more in this country than they do in Europe, and, and possibly it's because it's a lot of domestic American uh, companies that developed it. So, so I think there will there will always be some differences, and I, I see that as healthy. I see that as an interesting um, experimental process across the states, across the nations, to get a sense of what works and what doesn't. I would just add that. Uh I'm not sure that a lot of people who are in the tech se sector would use the term catching up for, for us to be uh, more emulating the Europeans because there are a lot of uh, folks who consider it very stifling. We saw that in the financial privacy debate. We see that in, in, the, um, in the California Privacy Act that was recently passed. It is not as restrictive as the EU, and I think uh, that, that is, is the result of the influence of the tech industry. To add a, a quick thought, I, so so I think that the notion of of catching up may be a, a fait accompli, in part because consumer facing uh, technology companies that are operating in the European market um, uh, have no have no choice but to comply with these regulatory regimes, particularly the the European General Data Protection Regulation imposes a, a number of constraints and obligations that companies have to. Uh, oblige uh, and fulfill and, and meet those requirements, um, and and that's independent of where they're they're domiciled. So if they're U.S. based and they affect European residents, they will have to comply. Which means, in part, they're building infrastructure for compliance, and oftentimes there's motivation for them to to apply that infrastructure across their entire consumer base. Now there are issues on the margins uh, when it comes to certain principles uh, and. Uh, and provisions within that regulation, but I think we are, we are going to see sort of a leveling up because of the, these uh, these uh, data protection regimes that are emerging in other markets, including Europe. We have two minutes. Any additional questions? We have a question in the very back. If somebody can run a microphone, this will probably be the last question. Yes. I, I was really uh, thrilled to hear the word transparency in the context of. Uh, privacy, and then the word threshold came up, and I just wondered if there's a way that, um, how, how can we combine um, more transparency without overwhelming consumers, so transmitting the information in a simple way, knowing that when we communicate, we'll cross thresholds and insult people who will respond, but all do it in a productive, not taking it personally way, knowing that because we're giving transparency, there will be more feathers ruffled, but that's part of the process and that's okay. Um, how can we get all of those pieces working together um, to move forward? Let me suggest one place to start. Uh, privacy notices that people can understand, that, that's in plain language, that tells you what they're collecting, you know, and how, and how they're using it. I mean, there may be one out there that that is that is succinct and clear. I haven't seen it yet. 
I, I agree that plain language notices are tremendously important, and, and that's an area Europe's been way ahead of us on in terms of requiring plain language. But I also think that you can't expect the consumer to protect themselves all the time. Um, so I, I may not understand biologic interchangeables enough to know that I trust to take that kind of medication, but I trust the FDA to tell me it's safe and that's good enough. It doesn't mean that you have to have government bodies. You can do it with industry bodies or other types of third parties that can mediate some of these issues. The consumer, the consumer really can't navigate it all alone. The plain language thing, that sounds like a Berman bill for next year. Yeah. I already introduced it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to wrap with that. With that, let's give our panel a round of applause.